and welcome to week nine of web design decal um sorry for the delay again um but yeah we're back and this week for design we're um we're going to be talking about dark design patterns um i think we're coming towards the point in the uh semester where we've pretty much hopefully been able to teach you guys most of the basics and fundamentals of um, visual design, especially um, in the first few weeks when we've talked about hierarchy and color, typography. Um, these are like the main elements that help um, make a design really strong. But I think um, now we're going to start to explore some topics like Asia. Last week talked about um, human-centered design process. Um, today we're going to be talking about dark design patterns. Like I said, we're going to be um, exploring more broad topics of design. So I think we might have one on branding or finding inspiration or create, creating portfolio actually. Um, so that's what's in store for you guys for the rest of the semester for design. But yeah, getting back on track with week nine, um, dark design patterns. Uh, what exactly are they and like how do we avoid them? So um, you might not know what this term means yet, but I think this is a um, really cool introductory video um, to what it really means um, to have, I guess, a dark design. Why are cities full of uncomfortable benches? This one has armrests to prevent you from dozing off. Here's another, again with the arms, the stiff metal, and this one, it's brand new. The MTA in New York City began installing them as a part of a subway enhancement plan. And they don't call it a bench. They prefer the term leaning bars. So what if I told you it was designed with discomfort in mind? New York City is filled with some of the most innovative architecture and urban planning in the world. Today, nearly every kind of public space here has been developed with close attention to detail. So these benches are no mistake. They're designed to allow you to sit, but not get too cozy, and that's intentional. The concept stems from a school of thought that goes by many names, but today we'll use defensive design. Defensive design is about moderating behavior. The goal is to limit the ways an object can be misused. These benches have armrests because that will prevent anyone from laying down. Their short back is another nod to say, this bench isn't yours forever. This trend is worldwide, and it's not just in the benches. When you start looking for defensive designs in New York City, you'll find examples everywhere. It's the presence of security cameras in subway turnstiles or in Times Square. It's these spikes on this column meant to deter birds. It's the knobs on these ledges made to discourage skateboarders. And there were once sprinklers underneath the awning of this bookstore to prevent people from sleeping there. It's sidewalk barriers. It's even these regular streetlights. Yeah, streetlights are probably some of the most recognizable defensive designs. When they surfaced in 19th century Western cities, the dynamic of urban life changed. Because of them, more people spent more time outside at night, which drove economic development and a reduction in crime. Most hostile architecture tries to influence behavior in a similar way. The designs attempt to make public space a bit more hospitable, more ideal. Defensive designs can deter crime. It can prevent the destruction of public property. And it can prevent loitering. But there is a reason why defensive design is characterized as hostile. Take the example of the leaning bar. Disability advocates have a problem with that appearing in the MTA. One advocate pointed out that people who travel who have disabilities or just get tired sometimes need a bench to sit on and not a wall to lean against. And while no one likes an uncomfortable bench, these additions mean something more for people who are experiencing homelessness. The United States is currently experiencing a decline in the overall homeless population. But in New York City, the number of homeless people is growing. About 1,800 people were found to have been sleeping in the subway. That's because emergency shelter isn't always a viable option. There are several examples of hostile architecture that target people who are homeless. 
These designs imply that public space is not where homeless people should be. As it goes, city planners have a dilemma. How do they design inclusive cities? As for the enhanced subway initiative, the MTA's mock designs highlight new USB ports and electronic signage and stations. But you won't find any press materials highlighting this uncomfortable bench. Excuse me, the leaning bar. That's because it makes for an uncomfortable discussion about who we design public space for and who gets left out. So I hope that gave a really quick introduction um, to, I guess, what the idea of a dark design trend is. And yeah, so let's get a little technical with some terms. Um, like, I, like the video mentioned, there's this term of defensive design, which is the practice of anticipating all possible ways that an end user could misuse a device or I guess a product or even like architecture. Um, and designing the, the device so as to make such misuse impossible or to minimize the negative consequences. Um, like the video talked about, um, it seems like a lot of um, designers intentionally design these public benches to have um, these little um, notches in between such as to minimize the number of homeless people um, sleeping on them. And I think... Um, on certain places on the internet, this is highly debated. Obviously, this is seen as anti-homeless architecture. Um, there are people who argue for it. It's a heavily discussed topic. Regardless, it's an example of defensive design. Moving on. So what exactly is dark or unpleasant design? So this um, is a term for a user interface that has been carefully crafted um, to trick users into doing things such as buying insurance with your purchase um, or signing up for recurring bills. For example, um, I <laughs> personally once have experienced this where I think in high school, before you get Amazon Prime for free, um, I signed up for Amazon Prime, like the trial version of it, but I didn't know that it would actually um, continue to charge me. Um, and also they didn't send me a reminder that my trial would end. so. Um, I ended up having to pay like a, an extra $100 um, before I remembered to cancel my subscription at the beginning of the, re the refresh cycle. Um, so yeah, that was like really unpleasant for me, obviously, as a user um, for Amazon Prime. But yeah, obviously we don't, um, we don't like the dark design trends. Um, and so what are more examples of this? Um, there's a bunch. I, think but like some of the most common examples this this is one called forced continuity um this is actually what i just described it's when your free trial with a service comes to an end and your credit card silently starts getting charged without any warning in some cases this is made even worse by making it difficult to cancel the membership horrible um moving on there's another example called the bait and switch um which is to advertise a free or greatly reduced product or service, which is unavailable or not stocked in, or either stocked in small quantities, sorry. After it's apparent that the product is no longer available, they're exposed to other price products similar to the one advertised. So I think an example of this could be like, um, I don't know, uh, recently, oh yeah. The <laughs> This is also another embarrassing example, but um, I don't know if you guys know, but Nintendo Switches across America are being bought out for ridiculous prices right now by scalpers because obviously with everyone being at home in the quarantine, um, everyone's looking for ways to keep themselves busy. So what better time than to splurge on a video game console? Um, as a result, I um, personally have been looking for these <laughs> for a switch online um but it's been really hard actually um and um they're being sold for like ridiculous um profits on ebay like 500 as opposed to regular 300 but um ebay sometimes will send me emails <laughs> like tempting me like hey this product is almost running out but we're still gonna advertise it because it's going for like 600 dollars 
Um, but yeah, bad design that tricks you into spending your money. There's also a lot of other um, terms. I think, uh, for example, there's ones called friend spam. There's like privacy zuckering, hidden costs, etc. If you're curious about all the different kind of design trends, I highly suggest um, you search them online. But yeah, these are all really like unpleasant things to experience. And in fact, we could pretty much even call them asshole designs. For example, this very GIF, GIF right here. So if I open this up, okay, cool. Let's enter. Loading, uh, no, let's not have notifications. No, I don't want this to be my home website. Oh, whoa, there are a lot of things happening. Uh, yeah, I'm over 18. Okay, here's my birthday. I just wanna, oh, you know, I know where I live. Uh, no, I don't wanna, you know, there's a lot of things going on here. Oh, there's even like a support team. Yes, I use an ad blocker. No, um, oh my gosh, you see, there's a lot of things going on in this GIF and it's like super anxiety inducing. There's a lot of things going on. Um, obviously, all with the intention of like grabbing your attention and giving them your information, name like your location, your email if you want to subscribe, when all you want to do in the first place was to just look at a simple web page, right? So this is an example of an asshole design. Moving on, we can see that, oh, this one's pretty notorious, but um, this one is an example of an Instagram story ad. Um, and you, you can see that um, what initially looks like a regular shoe ad is actually, um, there's a fake hair that has been Photoshopped on top of it to make the user think that, oh, there's a piece of hair, I need to brush it off my screen. And by doing so, you unintentionally swipe up on the ad, which is horrible. Like, why would you take advantage of people like that? You might think, oh, it's just like a few seconds, but like, if you multiply this kind of like distraction time by like the amount of users it's probably affected, this ad has probably brought in a lot of revenue. Moving on, this one's more of a like lighthearted one, I guess, but it's still kind of ridiculous. Like in the first example on the left, you can see that the packaging um, has the middle of the wrap covered, but when you actually open it, there's nothing in the center. Um, like you're wasting your money on what uh, seems to be a whole wrap. And then on the right one, uh, the, the right picture um, sandwich, it looks like there's like two whole slices of ham that go stretch like throughout the entire sandwich, but it's actually just a strip um, on the side to make it look like it has two whole slices of ham. Um, but these are just more, I guess, like silly examples. Um, this one I think is really annoying and this is one I see really uh, happen really often in my own inbox, but um, under like, I guess spam emails that you get or like newsletters, um, oftentimes you want to unsubscribe, but these companies will um, hide the unsubscribe um, link on purpose so that you can't unsubscribe in the first place. So in this GIF example, you can see that the unsubscribe is in white text, so you can't see it if you wanted to unsubscribe. Yeah, all really nasty things that were done intentionally. Um, this one is a, an example of like an app um, download, and what seems to be at first free, uh, it says only free for three days starting now. However, starting on a certain date, they will be charging you $50 a week. So um, the user interface will try to trick you by saying like you see, your eyes are drawn to that free word initially, but um, little did you know that there's a paid service. This one is horrible and evil, but <laughs> you can see that in the middle, that app, um, usually we click on our apps if they have a red notification because, well, that usually means that there's another human 
on the other end of the app trying to, you know, talk to us. They're trying to communicate us or there's, you know, some kind of notification that we need to check. So we click on it and we open the app. However, what you see here is an app um, thumbnail designed on purpose to have a permanent notification there to make you think that there's always a notification. So you always have to check it regularly or open it, which is an asshole move. But yeah, there's a simple reason why a lot of brands employ these kind of um, nasty UX tactics. It's because they want to nudge your the user towards or away from certain actions um, just to drive sales, gather more data, bump up their email list, you know, just like um, whatever they need to do to like hit their numbers, I guess, you know? Um, and this kind of like, this term dark design uh, trend actually really um, was coined in 2010 after the boom of like e-commerce and ads on the web. Um, but yeah, like the point is they want to generate these kind of sales and subscriptions. And in order to do that, they have to create these deceiving UIs to manipulate users. Um, so yeah. Um, and a lot of the examples I showed before, like these app purchases, um, the, the red notification, the sandwiches, I guess they, if anything, might seem annoying, but um, there can be cases where serious design decisions can lead to regret or namely a lot of ethical concerns. So um, this one is an example of um, a case where Instacart um, if you guys don't know what Instacart is, it's an app that lets you, um, it's kind of like a similar to Uber, but you have, um, the contracted workers on the other side do your grocery shopping. So for example, you'll open up Instacart and you'll select a certain, um, grocery store, say like Target or, uh, Walmart, and you'll per you'll search for specific items. So uh, let's say you want orange juice or bread flour and you'll put that into your cart. And what Instacart will do will is that it'll contact a worker to go to the nearest store, grab those specific items for you, check out and deliver them for you, which, which is like, you know, sounds like a modern day regular old app, but the problem is that a lot of Instacart, what a lot of Instacart workers had the problem with is that um, the UI on the Insta, on like the checkout, um, the default is to give the workers a 5% tip. And um, like, yeah, that's the default. But however, they a lot of them were like, were protesting because this is like, a lot lower than what the usual is. I believe for a lot of other food delivery services apps like Postmates, DoorDash, Uber Eats, um, the the regular like tip amount and the default is actually like 15 to 20 percent. Um, but the fact that the UI had like def the by default set it to 5 percent made a lot of users of the app just like neglect the fact that they could tip um, their workers more and thus as a result um, negatively impacted a lot of workers um, especially those who relied on instacart as their only source of income so yeah and then this one oh man um yeah so back in 2014 snapchat created a filter um for everybody's favorite holiday 420 um and the, the filter was actually uh, of Bob Barley with his locks and his beanie and everything. But the problem is that, you know, some engineer or some designer in like, I, I really don't know how this like Snapchat allowed this to happen, but like someone made the conscious decision that this was okay, which is clearly it is not because this is essentially digital blackface, um, which presents a lot of ethical concerns. Moving on in 2015, uh, Google Photos um, had basically run into issues with their photo algorithms, um, 
when Google Photos, like, if you run photos through it, it'll categorize it into different objects or people, things like that. And apparently, um, software engineer Jackie, I'll, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name, I'll sign, I'll sign, um, had received reports from his black friends that the Google Photos image recognition algorithms uh, had actually categorized his black friends as gorillas, which obviously has a lot of racial, racist implications. And apparently three years later, um, Google hasn't really, um, hasn't fixed it entirely. Instead, they've opted to um, block their algorithm from identifying gorillas altogether. And people found this out because they um, ran hundreds of thousands of images of different primates through the um, Google Photos algorithm. So like lemurs, chimpanzees, um, monkeys, and, and like you name it, but um, the category of gorilla actually never showed up. So this just proves that they like um, removed the category um, altogether to, to prevent like any sort of miscategorization in the future. Um, but yeah, like, <laughs> they're like, I guess what I mean to say is like, they're designers and engineers who are like consciously behind these kind of like choices and decisions. Um, and you know, they have a lot of ethical implications. Um, this one is Facebook's emotional manipulation experiment. Um, basically they, um, did a little test where like they would change people's feeds um, just to see if it would have any impact on people's um, Facebook statuses. So for some with they purposefully fill with like positive um, positive news feed items. So I don't know what the like puppies and kittens or just like a more positive news feed in general. And then for some, they put a more negative one and they found that like people with um, positive news feeds ended up posting more positive Facebook statuses and then vice versa, people with negative Facebook feeds would post more negative statuses. But yeah, the point is, is like that they like change and utilize people's data to like, you know, run their own experiment, which is like, huh ethical concerns <laughs> but yeah well on a high level what does this mean for designers in general like what do these questionable um dark design trends mean well as a ui ux designer you have a responsibility towards your business and the user it's your job to create unbeatable user experiences experiences that are transparent and unambiguous and honest, right? Making it easy for the user to take course of action they had in indeed set out to take in the first place. Like, we're not trying, like, as a designer, you don't want to do anything fishy um, to manipulate people, right? What you're trying to do is to cater to people's needs and, like, you know, make an experience easier for them. So, that's not really something we can do obviously given the nature of this lecture because there are no partners and we can't really share out loud with each other um but i guess if you want to take the time to pause this video and think about it uh what are some dark patterns in your own daily interactions that you've noticed um yeah so if you want to pause and go ahead and think about that go ahead otherwise um I actually have another video, really cool video to show about iPhone addictions or phones in general, I guess. I can't stop looking at my phone, but I'm not alone. Over 2.5 billion people have smartphones now, and a lot of them are having a hard time putting them down. There's a new app that aims to curb phone addiction. Addiction is money. Are we a nation of smartphone addicts? The problem is, our devices are designed to keep us engaged. They're intentionally addicting. 
But if you understand the tricks that grab your attention, you can learn to have a healthier relationship with your phone. I think we're living inside of two billion Truman shows. Where, you know, Truman show, you, know, you wake up and everything is sort of coordinated just for you and you usually don't even realize it. But it's coordinating just to entertain you or just to engage you. That's Tristan Harris. He worked as Google's design ethicist, and now he runs a nonprofit initiative called Time Well Spent, advocating for awareness of how tech companies profit off of users' attention. It's not, it's not designed to help us. It's just designed to keep us hooked. So I handed him my phone yeah. and asked him how he'd fix it. It starts with turning off all notifications, except for when a real human is trying to reach you. When you get a call, a text, or a message, it's usually because another person wants to communicate with you. But a lot of today's apps simulate the feeling of that kind of social interaction to get you to spend more time on their platform. If Facebook sends you a push notification that a friend is interested in an event near you, they're essentially acting like a puppet master, leveraging your desire for social connections so that you use the app more. But notifications didn't always work like this. When push notifications were first introduced for email on Blackberries in 2003, they were actually seen as a way for you to check your phone less. You could easily see emails as they came in, so you didn't have to repeatedly open your phone to refresh an inbox. But today you can get notifications from any app on your phone. So every time you check it, you get this grab bag of notifications that can make you feel a broad variety of emotions. If it wasn't random, if it was predictably bad or predictably good, then you would not get addicted. The predictability would take out the addictiveness. That's the same logic behind slot machines. And it's effective. Slot machines make more money in the US than baseball, movies, and theme parks combined. And they become addicting about three to four times faster than other kinds of gambling. Some apps even replicate the process of pulling a slot machine lever with the pull to refresh feature. That's a conscious design choice. Those apps are usually capable of continuously updating content, but the pull action provides an addicting illusion of control over that process. In the future, we might see healthier ways of delivering notifications. Research shows that bundling notifications, where phones deliver a batch of updates at set times, reduces user stress. Then, you have to grayscale your screen. The easiest way to attract your eye's attention on a screen is through color. Human eyes are sensitive to warm colors. In eye tracking tests like this one, they gravitate particularly to bright red. That's why so many apps have redesigned their icons to be brighter, bolder, and warmer over the years. It's also why notification bubbles are red. A little icon like this, or this, doesn't have the same impact on your attention as this. But you can neutralize that distracting effect by selecting a grayscale color filter in your phone's accessibility settings. When you make everything black and white, your brain isn't tricked into thinking this is any more important to you than this. I mean, there's a reason why slot machines are, you know, bright in color and have flashing lights and ding, 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 ding. And they have the sensory, app, like, input too, right? And so just noticing that if I take out the color, it changes the... Uh, some of the addictiveness. Finally, restrict your home screen to everyday tools. Make sure that your home screen, when you unlock it, doesn't have anything except for the in-the-moment tools that help you, like, live your life. I have, like, Lyft to get somewhere when I need to get somewhere, Maps, Calendar. None of these are apps that I can fall into and then get sucked down some bottomless vortex of stuff. If you're not sure what counts as a bottomless vortex of stuff, it helps to filter out apps that use infinite scrolling. Unlike pagination, where users have to click to load new content on another page, infinite scrolling continuously loads new material, so there's no built-in endpoint. Video autoplay works in a similar way. These interfaces create a frictionless experience, but they also reduce a user's sense of control and make it harder to stop. Research shows that people rely on visual cues more than internal cues to stop consuming something. In a 2005 study, individuals who ate soup out of a self-refilling bowl ate 73% more than those who ate out of a normal bowl filled up by servers. But those who ate from the self-refilling bowls didn't feel any more satisfied. So a visual cue, like an endpoint, is better at telling you the right time to stop than your own sense of satisfaction. And because so many apps don't have an endpoint, you have to build your home screen around the eventuality of distraction. We check our phones a lot. Most of us drastically underestimate how often we do so. But technology might not always look this way. There are ideas for alternative interfaces that give you functional choices and are more transparent about how much time you'll lose with one action versus another. But it's a really deep philosophical question. What is genuinely worth your attention on an interrupted basis? 
Do people even know how to answer that question? It's a really hard question. It's not something we think about. But for now, it's a question that everybody needs to start asking. Thank you so much for watching. This has been episode one. <laughs> so yeah, I think that video is like a really cool insight on how our phones can be super distracting to us in even such an un unconscious way, right? Um, I never really thought about infinite scrolling as being like a bad thing. If anything, I was just like, oh, it's cool that I don't have to click next or I can just like, you know, my thumb can just repeatedly do the same action. But I never really thought about how that actually just meant that there was no stop point, you know, like I could just scroll my feed forever. Um, even if I wasn't like particularly interested, you know, it's just something to do. Um, so yeah, um, just a video to, I don't know, get you thinking about everyday things. And lastly, I think um, to conclude this lecture, um, here's a link to a really cool article um, that talks, that's titled Dear Design Student. Um, and I really, really highly suggest reading it because I guess it, it's a really cool article that talks about like what it really means to be a designer. Cause you know, for first and foremost, um, before you're a designer, you're human. Um, and by choosing to design things, choosing to, to make products, um, for other people, you're choosing to impact other people who come across your work, you know? And that means, like, whatever you make, um, that can choose to help or hurt these kind of people, um, whether that be helping marginalized communities um, or maximizing profits for whatever business you work for, you know? Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's a decision that you consciously make. Um, so yeah, I'd highly suggest reading this article. And it doesn't even have to be design, it can just be like, I guess if you're a creator in general too. Yeah, and with that, um, thank you for tuning in to week nine of design for Web Design Decal. Um, hope everyone is staying safe. And uh, with that, I'll see you guys next week.